animal or a human is very thirsty, feel kind of agitated, you might get up and get a drink of water. If you're very thirsty, it can put you into a state of panic. If you're extremely thirsty and water is a limited resource, you might even result to violence to get it or negotiation of some sort that you wouldn't if you were calm. In the fascinating realm of neuroscience, one individual stands out as a guiding light, tirelessly pushing the boundaries of our understanding of the brain. Driven by a profound sense of urgency, the neuroscientist and tenured associate professor at Stanford University School of Medicine has devoted his career to unraveling the mysteries of the human mind. With a primary focus on the visual system, brain plasticity, and neural regeneration and repair, his research unveils the incredible potential for harnessing control over our brains. In a world where technological advancements are transforming the very fabric of our existence. The brain and nervous system, um, which so it's like brain, spinal cord, connections with the body and back again. I don't distinguish between brain and mind. I think that's like an 80s discussion or earlier. And I think it, it, it would take us down the wrong track. So brain or mind to me is interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, mind body is kind of interchangeable because the brain is connected to the body and the body's connected to the brain, right? If I you know, pinprick my hand and it hurts, my brain registers it, where it happens, it's kind of an irrelevant discussion now. I think we really need to just appreciate that the nervous system is designed to orchestrate all the processes in the body, not just thinking and not just behavior, and really can be divided into five things. So there's sensation, and sensation is really bound or restricted by the receptors in the body. So receptors in the eye that perceive photons, light energy, receptors in the skin that perceive pressure, you know, touch receptors, mm -hmm. smell, taste, hearing, etc. Urging us to seize the reins of our neurological destiny before it's too late. By unraveling the complexities of the brain, we can pave the way for a future where we hold the key to our cognitive evolution. Harnessing control over our brain is a timely endeavor. And Dr. Andrew Huberman stands at the forefront of this pursuit. Coined as the pioneer of non-sleep deep rest, his groundbreaking practice facilitates accelerated neuroplasticity and it combats mental and physical fatigue. Dr. Huberman's contributions extend beyond his coined term. As the esteemed host of the Huberman Lab podcast, he disseminates cutting-edge research on neuroscience and human performance. And the interesting thing about sensation and the fact that the nervous system needs to pay attention to sensation is it's non-negotiable. The nervous system of humans is designed to extract physical phenomenon from the universe that are non-negotiable, photons of light. I can't see in the infrared with my eyes, and I can't see ultraviolet light with my eyes, and I can't perceive that because I don't have the receptors for it. So, you know, other animals can perceive some of those things, but that leads us to the next thing, which is perception, which is which sensations are you paying attention to? So all the time you're sensing things, like right now your feet are sensing the contact with your shoes, but you're not thinking about it until I say that, uh -huh. and then you shift your perception. Right. So perception is like this spotlight. So the brain wants to, constantly bring in sensation. It's non-negotiable what's coming in. It's just dependent on your environment. Perception is negotiable. You can control that because I just said shoes and you thought about your feet and mm -hmm. there you are. Then there are feelings, which can be a little bit nebulous, but feelings are a link between our emotion and it generally invokes the body, sensations in the body and concepts in the mind of what those sensations are about. That's really what emotions are. Animals definitely experience them. I'm kind of appalled to think that 10 years ago, people like, do animals have emotions? Of course they have emotions, right? right? Because those are bodily sensations merged with some perception. So of course they do. And then there's thoughts. And thoughts are interesting because thoughts happen spontaneously. Think about like a web browser that's constantly giving you pop-ups. Mm -hmm. His platform serves as a hub of knowledge, offering a captivating exploration into the depths of the human mind and the potential for enhancement. By delving into his work, we gain valuable insights into the intricate workings of our brain, empowering us to seize control before it slips away. In this fast-paced world that we live in today, it's crucial to recognize the importance of harnessing control over our brains before it's too late. With a firm belief in evidence-based practices, he passionately emphasizes the significance of improving our brain health and function through proven methods. As a frequent speaker at conferences and events focused on neuroscience and human performance, he educates and he inspires audiences urging them to take charge of their cognitive well-being. But thoughts can also be deliberate. So you and I can decide right now that we're gonna think about a plan for something, or we're gonna think about what's going on in the world. So thoughts happen spontaneously and they can be deliberate. And then the final thing is behaviors and actions. So the nervous system is responsible for sensation, perception, feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. And what's interesting 
you start to think about that as you're like, okay, that's a lot, but what is the nervous system really trying to accomplish? Like on any given day or at any moment, what's it trying to accomplish? And it's really trying to accomplish one thing, which is to take perceptions of the outside world and merge those with perceptions of the inside world, what we call interoception, and to link those in a way that's operating on our environment in the appropriate way. Uh -huh. So what do I mean by that? So if I'm feeling anxious and I'm in a very calm environment, I'm gonna perceive that rapid heart rate and kind of feeling of agitation in my body as inappropriate for the moment, right? And my goal then as, a, as an organism is to adjust my, my level of what they call autonomic arousal or alertness down. If I'm at a, at a great party or I'm at a wedding or it's a celebration or I'm at a protest or, you know, um, then I might feel that my level of alertness is appropriate for my environment. So the nervous system is in this constant dynamic interaction with the outside world and trying to figure that out. By understanding the inner workings of our brains and implementing strategies backed by science, we can unlock untapped potential, enhancing our mental capabilities and ultimately lead more fulfilling lives. It is never too late to seize control over our most powerful tool, our minds. The latest research on brain health and function highlights the key factors that can significantly improve our cognitive well-being. Sleep, exercise, diet, stress management, and cognitive training have emerged as crucial pillars in this pursuit. By delving into these areas, scientists have uncovered compelling evidence-based strategies that can benefit individuals of all ages. Adequate sleep promotes optimal brain function and consolidation of memories. One way that this can be kind of conceptualized is there's an emerging idea that's kind of interesting about impatience. So we've all had the feeling of being impatient. Some people are far more patient than others. But if you've ever been in line at the store and you feel like something's going very slowly, you know, the person in front of you is taking a long time, they're doing some returns and you're getting kind of impatient, maybe you're breathing in a mask and you're like, oh, like you're, you know. What's the idea is that if you're getting a certain frequency of pulses from your body, and if those pulses are coming in quickly, like you're perceiving your, yourself, that interoception quickly, it's like pulse, 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 mm -hmm. pulse. You're gonna be more geared towards your internal representation. And then you're seeing what's going on in the outside world and it seems like it's going very slowly. But there are other times when you're in line at the store, someone's getting some returns and you're texting on your phone or you've had a great day, you've had a great run, your family's in great shape and you're fine. Why? Well, the frequency of those pulses, that interoception is matched pretty well to your outside environment. And so impatience is really when your in internal sort of metronome, tick, mm -hmm. tick, 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 is not matched well to the external mm. environment. While regular exercise enhances blood flow and stimulates the growth of new brain cells, a balanced diet rich in nutrients and antioxidants nourishes the brain, while effective stress management techniques mitigate the harmful impact of chronic stress. Additionally, engaging in cognitive training exercises sharpens mental acuity and enhances cognitive flexibility. By implementing these scientifically backed practices, we can cultivate brain health and function, enabling us to lead fulfilling and thriving lives at any stage. Andrew Huberman stands at the forefront of brain control exploration in the era of rapid technological and neurological advancements. The human brain, the marvel of complexity, holds untapped potential, yet raises intriguing and alarming possibilities. There are other times when you're feeling like your internal metronome is tick, 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 and you've got a million things coming at you through email or text, and you've got a bunch of things, and you're feeling overwhelmed and tired. Well, in either case, there's nothing right or wrong. It's just your body and your brain are trying to say, what's going on in the outside world and how well matched am I to it? Right. So if you think about some of the, the sort of core practices of mindfulness and self-regulation of like, focusing on breathing or focusing on, on you know, state of mind, a lot of that is trying to bring more awareness to your internal state. Huberman's work urges careful consideration as we navigate the ethical implications of manipulating our thoughts, emotions, our, our memories. While brain control offers therapeutic interventions and cognitive enhancements, it also poses risk of abuse and intrusion. Society must engage in a collective dialogue establishing ethical frameworks and transparent regulations. The future lies in balancing scientific progress and safeguarding individual aut autonomy. Huberman's research catalyzes this discourse, emphasizing responsible exploration. But what our brain is normally doing when our eyes are open and we're interacting in the world is we're constantly trying to update our internal state to match external demands of the world. And this harkens back to a, you know, like a really 
early design of all nervous systems, which is how do you take an organism that needs certain things, food, water, mates, reproduction, shelter, how do you move that organism? How do you create a system that will do that in best relation to the environment? And so what Mother Nature has done is designed a, a series of systems. Let's just take agitation and stress for one. If an animal or a human is very thirsty, you feel kind of agitated, you might get up and get a drink of water. If you're very thirsty, it can put you into a state of panic. If you're extremely thirsty and water is a limited resource, you might even result to violence to get it or negotiation of some sort that you wouldn't if you were calmer. So that stress and agitation were designed to actually mobilize the body to take us in the direction of something that's adaptive. Mm. So you can start to see these kind of core elements of what the brain and nervous system do, sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and action. And this constant challenge of trying to match our internal state to the external real estate, the outside world. And you start to see that the sensations that we call stress or impatience or calm are really the result of that, those attempts that the nervous system is trying to perform. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I think that, you know, in terms of value of understanding the nervous system and where it can be steered, it's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response to uh -huh. experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself uh, in order to be in concert with its surroundings and to optimize that just the, the way we described a minute like ago. Like the way that mm -hmm. a child can learn a language very quickly or, or three languages. play the guitar or something like yeah, that. Yeah, without an accent, you know, right. three languages without an accent. It's remarkable. You try and do that after age 25, it's very challenging. And so the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. I certainly believe that our state of mind and body at any point in time is strongly dictated by our state of mind and body in the hours and days prior to that. And on the one hand, people are going to hear that and say, well, duh, you know, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to feel like garbage. And if you're well rested, you'll feel great. That's kind of the top contour of it. Mm -hmm. But when one looks at the neuroscience, for instance, of sleep, you start to realize that, you know, the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that you're going to get in any 90 minute bout of sleep your sleep is broken up into these 90 minute segments, more or less, is strongly dictated by the ratio of slow wave sleep, aka deep sleep and rapid eye movement sleep that you had in the previous 90 minute bout. And then when you start to look at the research in terms of waking states, you start to find that your ability to be focused, say for a bout of work in the morning or the afternoon or a creative brainstorm session, or I don't know, to maybe drill into some personal issue that you're dealing with during therapy or just on a walk or while journaling is not a square wave function. You know, none of us should sit down and expect ourselves to just drop into that state. Mm -hmm. Much of our ability to move into that state effectively, whatever effective means, right? Whatever the target or goal of that bout, as I'm calling it is, is going to be dictated by what happened in the previous moments and hours. And so when I zoom out from that, what I've doubled down on is this idea that there are just a core set of foundational things that we have to re-up every 24 hours. Our mental health, our physical health, and our ability to perform is so strongly dependent on our ability to get quality sleep. Maybe not every night of our life. I, I mean, we have to be realistic, but that sleep is vital. So a hat tip is insufficient. So sleep is critical, but sleep is just one of about I would say five things that really set the, the buoyancy or the foundation upon which our nervous system is able to accomplish these transitions that I'm talking about at all. Mm -hmm. And those five things are sleep, right? In the absence of quality sleep over two or three days, you're just going to fall to pieces. In the presence of quality sufficient sleep over two or three days, you're going to function at an amazing level. There's a gain of function and a loss of function there. It's mm -hmm. not just if you sleep poorly, you function less well. You sleep better, you function much better. Mm -hmm. So sleep, I would say, is at the top of the list. Nutrients, you know, and there are, you can think macronutrients. And so your carnivores are only eating meat and your vegans are only eating plants and your 
your omnivores, which is I think probably 90% of the world is eating a combination of those. But you know, quality nutrients, I think that when I look at all of the nutrition literature and arguments out there, it seems that everyone can agree on one thing, which is that probably 80% or more of our nutrition should come from unprocessed or minimally processed sources. Minimally processed would require some cooking, but could survive on the shelf as opposed to packaged foods or highly palatable foods. So you've got sleep, nutrients, but then we should also put in micronutrients. And this is where maybe we'll get into a discussion about supplementation. I think that there's supplementation or supplements is a bit of a misnomer because it implies vitamin supplements. And people say, well, can't you get all that from food mm. or that whey protein? Isn't that just food? Wouldn't you be better off with a chicken breast? Okay, well then when you talk about convenience and the you know, absorption, okay. But then there's this huge category of things ranging from the kind of esoterically named things like ashwagandha and shilaji and tongali and fadogia grass, I mean, right? I mean, it sounds all exactly all the herbal <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. You're not going to get that from food. Yeah, totally. So should we call them supplements at all? Yeah. So let's just say the second thing is nutrients and that includes macronutrients and that includes micronutrients as well. Mm -hmm. So those two things. Then the third would be movement, right? And this has also been an enormous transition in the last, I think, just five years, which is not just for people interested in bodybuilding or powerlifting or for competitive athletes, but now it seems everybody, including the elderly, understand that you need a combination of cardiovascular exercise and you need resistance training, whether or not it's with body weight or weights or machines, et cetera, that you need both. I mean, not a week goes by without seeing an article in one of the major publications out there, standard media, let's call it traditional media. We'll be nice to them, traditional media. <laughs> that highlights some studies showing that, you know, resistance training in elderly people can offset Alzheimer's or, you know, or that as our friend Peter Atia has pointed out so many times that many of the end of life creating injuries are due to people, older people stepping down the eccentric movements. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so you need movement. That's the third category. Fourth is light, in particular mm -hmm. sunlight in the early part and throughout the middle of the day and trying to minimize the amount of artificial light that you're exposed to in the evening and late night hours, most of the time, because you have to live life. Just fundamental. And then the last category that's important is social connection, aka relationships. Let's just call it relationships because that can include relationship to self. Mm -hmm. So those things set up the core foundation. And I think one way to think about them is just as a list. Another is to think about them in terms of a, of a schedule basis. And that's how I've really doubled down is I realize that every 24 hours, I need to invest something into each one of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, or even two years ago, I used to think, okay, like what's the workout split or how am I going to eat for the next couple of months? You know, what am I trying to optimize for? Is it muscle? Is it fat loss? Is it just maintaining? Is it energy? Is it focus? That's all fine and good, but sleep, nutrients, exercise, light relationships, those really establish the foundation of what I consider to be all of the elements that create our ability to move as seamlessly as possible between the states that we happen to be in and the states we desire to be in. Mm -hmm. And when I zoom out and I think about what are the major struggles that I, and it seems most everyone deals with, it's like how to get more focused. Okay. So we can talk about, you know, what do you take? What's the supplement, you know, but you have to say, well, how are you sleeping? Have you done any exercise? You really always find yourself, or I find myself taking 10 steps back and then moving through the sequence of five things before you can even begin to talk about whether or not taking three or 600 milligrams of alpha GPC and how often to do that and does it work? And yes, it works, et cetera. But those things really set the foundation. And so I like to think of those five things every single day. You have to re-up on sleep every 24 hours or try to. You have to re-up on movement every 24 hours. You can go a day or so immobile, but you better move the next day right? Mm -hmm. And ideally you're moving seven days a week. 